Hello everyone, I am Dana, Diversity Dana is what they call me out in the world and my pronouns are she and her. I specialize in diversity and inclusion and my aim is to help organizations build diverse brands and create inclusive cultures that reflect the world that surround us and where people feel like they can belong and thrive and they wanna stick around. And every year for Black History Month, I do a session just like this one, focusing on an element of the Black experience. So last year I spoke about microaggressions. This year is about colorism. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen and to learn. Now, the theme for this year's Black History Month is proud to be. I have loved it as a theme because I feel like I'm in a place where I do feel really proud to be who I am. And I would like to share a little bit of who I am with you today as we live, go through today's session. For those of you who don't know me so well, I'm from Trinidad in the Caribbean. And you might be wondering why I stressed in the Caribbean. And it's because just last week, someone asked me where in Africa Trinidad was. Um, I often get asked sometimes where in Jamaica Trinidad is as well. But before you roll your eyes and start getting all smug up, up here on the Zoom, which one of these is Trinidad? Let's get some answers in the chat if you're feeling like it's in a cat. Do you even know which one of these is Trinidad? Lennox is in there with the B. Jessica's in there with the B as well. Everybody else is like, I'm not sure. Kate's is B as well. Crystal is like, I was going to go with C. Damn it, is it B? Uh, yes, <laughs> it is B. It's B. That first one is Jamaica. The second one is Trinidad and Tobago. And the third one is Barbados. And it's okay if you're guessing and it's okay if you're rubbish with geography. That's here, yeah, right? It's Trinidad and Tobago, two islands, one nation. And just to help you place where we are in the world, we are at the very end of the Caribbean archipelago, closest to Venezuela. What? You don't know where Venezuela is? Okay, let me zoom. I'm going to zoom out again. We would be here somewhere right around that area. We're a very tiny island on a world map. We would be a dot, but it's a very beautiful island. And now that you know where Trinidad is and you can picture it in your mind, I can let you know that as we go through today's session and we're talking about here and there, I'm going to teach you some Trini slang as well. So you're getting a two for one deal today just because it's proud to be month and I'm feeling really proud to be. So great question from Crystal in the chat as well. Would people from Tobago, Tobago say they're Tobagonians, Trinidadians might say they're Trinidadians, but if you want to refer to the collective, uh, you would probably say Trinbagonians. <laughs> So Trinidadians and Tobagonians all together. Trinbagonians is what we say. That is a brilliant question. And I'm glad that the geography lesson is helping everyone. Brilliant. So now for your first Trini slang of the day, it is, let we go, which means <laughs> let's get started, right? That's an easy one, right? Let we go, let's get started. And today I am starting this talk about colorism from a very strange place. I am starting in 2013. That's where I'm going to 2013. In 2013, my husband and I, we had just bought our house, our first home here in the UK. It was a lovely little flat in a dead end horseshoe thing, which is called a close, as the Brits like to say, right? And on our very first day moving in, our next door neighbor came over to introduce herself. She was lovely, very friendly, very chatty. She was over 80s, a white woman, I promise you her race is relevant. And she lived with a husband named Frank in the house next door. She told us her name was Irene, but everyone called her Rini, very sweet. We told her a little bit about ourselves and she welcomed us to the neighborhood. It was great. Now, after that move-in day, more of our neighbors started coming to meet us and we were a little freaked out, I'm gonna be honest with you, because they seemed to already know about us and who we were uh, when they came to introduce themselves. 
And that is when we realized that the Lamborghini was, wait for it, the Village Maco. There is your second bit of Trinidadian slang, right? Uh, like a, a busy body, a nosy pucker, gossips a little bit. And let me tell you, she was lovely. She was a great neighbor to have, but this is a true thing, right? And this was pre-COVID times when people went to work in offices every day. Do you remember that? Maybe you're still doing it now. And so the delivery men drop off everybody's packages at Ringy's house. You'd have to go there to pick them up. And she would hold you in a conversation. Your payment for leaving the package there was the chat that you would have to have with her. Sometimes even with a cup of tea when you went to pick things out. My husband and I used to rock, paper, scissors for it to see who would have to go over there and get the parcel and stay for however long and have a chat. Anyway, one day I was coming home from work and Rini flagged me down and I came over to the fence and she said to me, Dana, let me tell you something about Black people. I stopped breathing. I have never wanted to run away from a conversation more in my life. I was thinking, oh gosh, this is going to be bad. But Dana, whatever she says, you have to stay calm. Stay calm. You cannot be attacking little old ladies verbally in the street, right? So I was trying to do my neutral face and get ready. And what she said was a little, a little set of words that's become famous in my household now. We've spoken about it so much. She said, Dana, some people are yellow brown like you. And some people are more medium brown like your sister who was visiting me at the time. Some are really dark brown like your husband, and then she went really soft and she said, but some are so black that their skin almost looks navy blue. It's fascinating telling me this at the fence. And I mean, how do you respond to that? How does one respond to that? I don't know how I responded. I was, I was quite shell shocked in the moment. Um, but yes, yes, Renny, you were right. Black people do come in all shades and yes it is fascinating and even the people who say i don't see color i promise you are seeing it right like Rini was seeing it now the sad thing is though that society doesn't always see those different shades of brown those different shades of black as being equal and this is where the discussion of colorism now, I want to fast forward from 2013 to 2019. 2019. In 2019, my husband and I had our chunkses, Noah and David. There we go. There they are. Our little chunks. What word is that? Chunkses. Wait for it. It's another Trinidadian word, chunks or chunks for short is a term of endearment, dear, darling, love, that sort of thing. Chunks is, yeah. And they are twins, but they are not identical. They're not identical, except to the degree that all babies look and sound the same at 2 a.m. when you're sleep deprived and you don't know which kid you're holding, right? But two different skin tones. They're much closer in shade now, but in the baby phase, it was a little more marked and it was talked about a lot, right? Crystal is a big fan of chunkalunks. That's what people are going to take away from today. That's a big word, right? Now, this is them at six months when we took them to Trinidad to meet the family. So this is a picture of them in Trinidad. So you can see exactly what their skin tones were like then. And we took them to meet one of my grandfathers. And he said something like, oh, hand me the black one or something about the black one and the white one and uh, whatever. And in my heart, I was thinking, what the? 
But, but listen, there is this whole thing about respecting your elders in Trinidad and it sticks with you and you feel like you can't say anything, even though my whole life and job is about saying something, the words just weren't coming. I was frozen in the moment, but it was okay because in came my mom, like the very definition of a mama bear. And what you need to know about my mom is that she's normally pretty chilled out. She's like a natural peacemaker. She's the peacemaker of the family. And she looked at him and she went, they are both brown. They are both brown. Just like that. <laughs> and it became, I mean, everyone was silent. I was silent. My husband and I were watching each other. I mean, it was just like a magic moment of full on nananess that was amazing. And I will remember that moment for the rest of my life because I still, have to deal with the separation of the twins based on color. So people often refer to Noah, who's a slightly lighter skinned twin, as a red man, which is a Trini thing. So a red man. And then I have to say, who? So that they use his name and call him by his name and not by an identifier. Uh, and it's a whole thing, right? Now, now that I've told that story, you are probably thinking that colorism is a black black person thing. It's a black people thing. It's about the black community. And hmm, now I've put up this quote. It's one of my, oh, there they are again. I, I put in, I forgot I put in an extra picture because, you know, chunkalunks, right? <laughs> Once I was doing a session on colorism, and I had this amazing quote, so I like to include it in my sessions going forward. I told that story and the response back from someone in the audience was, oh, so this is like a black on black thing. <laughs> <coughs> and look, I get it. It might feel that way, but Vanessa, you're absolutely right. It is not, and we'll get there, but it definitely does feel that way. Like it's a black people, it's your thing. You all sort this out. Um, especially when there's lines like these in rap songs, like what? Wait for it. This is a song, there's a line from a Lil Wayne song called Right Above It. Now let's strip away that layer of misogyny before we get in there, right? And he's talking about a woman who is black and beautiful, but then says right after that she would be more beautiful if she was a red woman. So if she was lighter skinned in one of his hit songs, how do you feel growing up hearing that rhetoric about yourself from within your whole community? It's really annoying. And what's even more annoying about this, and I promised myself I wouldn't go off on a tangent, but this story makes me so angry. Lil Wayne actually has a dark skin daughter. He does. His daughter is dark skin. And so when the fans raised this and started coming at him for this lyric, instead of apologizing, um, learning something, trying to be different, he said, she will be the last black skin child I have because I've made sure that all my other baby mamas from this point forward are going to be light skinned. So he doubled down and then he tripled down because he was like the difference between you, one of the persons who was commenting to him and my daughter is that my daughter will be a dark skinned millionaire. And who are you? basically. So he tripled down on that comment. <laughs> Amazing note from Hong An in the chat. She's saying, form a cue for Lil Wayne now, ladies. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons why people think that this is a Black community issue. And yes, his poor daughter, because she will ultimately find this. The internet is forever, right? So it isn't. It isn't a community issue. It is a mainstream issue. And so maybe I should get into defining what it is before people all go, phew, this one isn't for me. I can just sit here. I can log off. This isn't my thing. It's not about me. Right. Colorism 
uh, people attribute it to Alice Walker. She won a Pulitzer Prize, um, first mentioned in 1982. And I'll go with the Oxford Dictionary definition. Oh, no, before that, my commentary on Lil Wayne, that he is dotish. But then I thought, Dana, you can't, can you use this word? We shouldn't be calling people stupid and silly. It's inappropriate. So then I thought, instead of teaching you dotish, but remember dotish, but I can pretend I told you not to say that word, um, is this one. But AA, I'm going to have to use it for you, right? So if somebody says something and you were kind of taken aback by that thing and you're like, how dare you? You would go, but AA like that. <laughs> you got to put some attitude behind it. You can't just go, but AA, you'll have to go, but AA, you know, just, okay, sorry. Maybe that was too much. You can work your way up to that one. You can work your way up to it. See how it goes. Work your way up. Okay. So what is it? It's prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone, typically among people of the same ethnic or racial group. Okay. I just want to be clear. It's already coming through in the chat. So I'm going to reiterate. Colorism isn't an issue that's unique to the Black community. Of course, it's not. There are many cultures and communities that have the belief that lighter colored individuals of the same race are better than colored ones. And that is a mainstay of many cultures. Literally, anywhere that you see that skin lightening treatments are being openly advertised in our normal part of the culture will have that issue. I remember going on a sunshiny holiday with a friend who is Chinese. And she was so panicked about staying out of the sun because in her words, she didn't want to get too black. Those are her actual words, not my words, but it's something that will stay in my memory. So this is a global issue. While today's chat is gonna have the lens of blackness because that's what I know, it's the thing from which I can speak to you. It's really good to bear in mind that this is happening all around the world, right? All around the world in different communities. Now, while we can see colorism within the Black and other minority communities, and Black people themselves can obviously be perpetrators of ideologies that are colorist, it doesn't mean that nobody else is guilty of it, right? In fact, that is not the case. It just isn't the case. And I had to think about colorism from the lens of where it started, right? And what am I talking about? I'm talking about slavery. I am talking about slavery. Have to talk about it. Because in those days, um, lighter colored slaves were more likely to be house slaves and darker colored slaves were more likely to be slaves in the field. And I'm not saying that darker skinned slaves could never become house slaves. I mean, everybody's seen Gone with the Wind, right? But it was less likely. Now, obviously, slavery sucks either way. So I don't want the narrative to be, oh, house slaves had a lovely, cushy life, because they did not, right? What they did get while being abused is better food and clothes. Well, obviously, because you're in the house, and in some cases, better treatment because you got to avoid the sun. Uh, so maybe less abuse, right? But still that dichotomy there, which is really important. And just to reiterate what I'm saying here, where do you get lighter colored slaves from? Okay, so it's literally slave masters and overseers self-selecting the products of rape that looked more like them, right? So basically they selected a group of people who they determined to have made better by the addition of their genes and then elevated them a little bit. Not all the way, right? Because then other wouldn't be slaves, but you know what I'm saying, right? You know what I'm saying. They created a me that break between the community. So for all the people who want to say, Oh, yeah, this is a Black issue. It is a Black issue that was perpetrated 
by white supremacy, because that is what slavery and enslavement is. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, okay? In the world as well, white is synonymous with light and, and purity and goodness, and black is synonymous with darkness and evil. And in that world, we were always gonna have a problem. We were always going to have a problem. This trope of light-skinned people being better, smarter, more attractive than their darker-skinned counterparts because they have a closer proximity to whiteness, it continued past slavery. So it may have started in slavery, but it continued way past that. So in a post-slavery landscape, if you go online, especially for the Jim Crow Museum, you can see job ads where the only requirement is that you're a lighter skilled skin black person. That's it. That is it, right? And so then obviously this started to be reflected within black communities. And I'm speaking specifically about the brown paper bag test. So the brown paper bag test uh, is from the civil rights era. And basically it compares a black person's skin tone to a brown paper bag. If your skin is the color of the bag or lighter, you got special permission to access clubs, churches, fraternities. But if your skin was darker than the bag, in some cases, you were restricted from coming in. I'm going to just pop to the chat very quickly because I'm seeing some beautiful things coming in. Um, Steve-O talking about um, in post-colonial societies where we've tried to rename certain terms to avoid the collection connection of darkness and black with evil. So like blackboard, chalkboard or whatever, right? That kind of thing. Um, Jude sharing about the experiment with the dolls, which by the way, I do talk about later, but great to be able to share this, right? Um, Rosalind chiming in to say that now it seems like white and lighter people are seeking to have darker skin, which is a whole other issue that I cannot wait to get my teeth into one of these days, uh, in one of these. Um, I'm getting a question about the paper bag test. Black people were doing it to each other. So basically, if you wanted to join an elite black organization, in that era, the brown paper bag test was a thing, right? Where you would, that's what you would get measured against. So the community started using it as a barometer for each other. Now, I've put these photos close up to each other because when I told my friend group that I was planning to do the session that was about colorism, I got some pushback. So Actually, I'm going to poll for it first. I should just ask, would I, would Dana pass the brown paper bag test? Would I get let into those elite organizations? Would I, would I, would I? What do you think? Yes or no? That's what, oh, so I would get in. I would pass. Myra's like, no, I wouldn't pass, right? <coughs> this is great. I see shades, right? Am I in the sun that day? Have I been to the beach, right? It depends. I don't know if I would pass or not. Ben's kind of like, maybe. Well, that was the pushback. So I was chatting with my friends. We were gathered. It was informal. By the way, the Trinidadian word for that is a lime. A lime, an informal gathering or hangout is called a lime. And you can say we are liming if a group of us are socializing together. So there's a, a Trini term for you there, right? And the pushback was, well, Dana, we think that you yourself experience a degree of light skin privilege. And I had to check myself on that. So light skin privilege are those privileges afforded by the fact that you are either a light or light to medium shade of brown. And to some extent, I accept that critique and I embrace it. I will not know the full experience of being um, 
a very dark person of color, I won't, I accept that, but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk about it. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to talk about it when I am in a community where I see it and where it's a thing that is important and, and that matters. I am always going to talk about it. But I thought to myself, let me use some of the words of people who don't experience lighter skin privilege. So let's start with Lupita Nyong'o, okay? So she defines what colorism is and she calls it the daughter of racism in a world that rewards lighter skin over darker skin. Find that very, very interesting, by the way. I think Lupita is stunning, just absolutely breathtaking. However, she speaks all the time about growing up feeling uncomfortable with her skin color because she felt like the world around her rewarded lighter skin. So she has a sister who has a lighter complexion than she does. And she talks about her sister being praised and constantly being called beautiful and pretty and those adjectives being left out for her. She was smart, but not beautiful. And it translated for her into feelings of unworthiness. And she has this beautiful book, it's called Soul Way. Um, I might link to it at the end, which it, it is a beautiful book. And it is about a dark skinned girl who is darker than everyone around her. And it is written in a way that you get a sense of what she experienced in her childhood what she thought about herself and how she had to reframe some of that thinking. It actually is, is a stunning book and I, I completely recommend, beautiful uh, graphics as well. And Viola Davis, uh, Emmy Award winning, she talks about the fact that even though that paper bag test isn't being physically used in today's society, she feels it. She feels that black women of a certain color are not allowed to be framed as sexy. If you are not a light skinned black woman, apparently you're not desirable. You're no longer desirable. So she talks very strongly about that. She also talks about how long it took her to be able to get a meaty role in Hollywood because she, like Lupita, by the way, who was told that she was too dark to be on television, kept getting rejected from stronger roles, right? I'm going to go to a really good comment from Steve-O just while I focus on Zendaya for a moment saying, I know my dad was very dark. My mother was white, so I'm a little dark of medium. I'm not sure where that puts me. And I still get surprised when I get called an effing black. Right? So, I mean, still happening. And so this is Zendaya, who would be an acceptable black. And she is always calling out colorism. She uses her platform very well. And she says, look, I know I'm Hollywood's acceptable version of a black girl, but I want to change that. We are too beautiful and too interesting for me to be the only representation of that. And I think that's amazing. And she constantly is calling it out. Here is Whale. He's a rapper. He talks about Drake and Sean Paul, who are lighter skin, having more opportunities for success because of their lighter skin color. And this is even in the rap game, which is a space that should be embracing of all Black people, right? Now, this is one of my favorite quotes. This is from, from when Obama was running. And this is how he is a Democrat, by the way. This is important to note. And at the point, he was the then Senate majority leader in the U.S. And he said, Obama has a good shot at getting elected thanks to his light skinned looks and lack of Negro dialect unless he wants to have one. Right. So he's saying that Obama can switch on off his Negro dialects and that that is an asset for him. And what I have to say to Harry Reid, he apologized, by the way. Um, not the best apology in the world, but, you know, a thing. And what I have to say to him is this. Uh-huh. That is another little Trinidadianism for you. Uh-huh means really. Is that so? 
you don't say, uh -huh. mm. you can accompany an uh -huh with a side eye. Uh -huh. That's why he's getting the side eye for the Negro dialect. Exactly. That's why the chat's going, yeah, that's why he's getting that little side eye. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Matthew knows he's Beyonce, father and manager. And he called it. He was like, when it comes to black females, who are the people who get their music playing on pop radio? Mariah, Rihanna, Nikki, my kids. And what do they all have in common? They are lighter skinned black women is what he is trying to say, is what he is calling out. And I promised myself that I was not going to have a whole thing about Nicki Minaj today. So I'm just, I'm just gonna move on to the next thing. I'm not, I'm not doing my whole Nikki freak out that I normally do at this point because she made me angry with some of her COVID related comments about you. I'm not doing, next slide. Good, Bridgerton. Any Bridgerton fans in the house? Bridgerton, let's talk about it. Any fans? I'm a big fan. I am a <laughs> So is Vanessa. I love it. Yes. Ross and Singh, I've not seen it, but I thought it's great. All right. <laughs> Sharon is saying we need to swerve Nikki. You know, she is my countrywoman. And okay, no, no, Dana. Bridgerton, Bridgerton, Bridgerton. Now, I should tell you that I try to watch TV on one level. I try to watch it on the escapism level and keep it there, but I never can. I can't do it. Oh my goodness. Aren't they beautiful though? I don't even know who to look at more, her or him. Bridgerton totally binged it. It was in that period between Christmas where it could be Boxing Day and it could be New Year's Eve and you don't know because all the days blend into each other. Great. And I watched it and I loved it. And I continue to watch it and I continue to love Shonda Rhimes. However, however, I have some things about Bridgerton that I just, I just need to say them today. Okay. So if you look, Bridgerton is lauded as being a really diverse cast. And in it, they talk about how Black people have been elevated to the upper echelons of society. And it's supposed to make Black people being in positions of wealth and power ubiquitous. However, look at the skin complexion of the Queen and Regé and uh, the actress playing Marina, right? Just, just focus. Focus on those, right? There are other things that I could go into, other tropes, but I'm just leaving it there on this level for now, right? Just leaving it there. Then let's look at some of the other actors in this, right? I'm gonna start on the right, okay? So this, was the Duke of Hastings friend who was a boxer and yes obviously he is a boxer yeah okay cool get that however that trope of the untouchable burly black man who is the strongest and prized for his physical abilities I don't know it smacked me in the face made me feel a little uncomfortable then in the middle is Lady Danbury I love Lady Danbury. She is great. However, she's darker skinned. And in her own words, her character is a little bit scary. Her character is also single and hasn't found love in the story, which, by the way, is something that is common to women with darker skinned tones. More likely to be single. Did you know that? That's in there as well. And then finally, the villain of this beautiful story is the darkest skinned character of them all. And I'm sorry, but my heart has a problem with that. My heart has a problem with the villain being the darkest person. And there are people, other people in the cast who have a similar skin tone, 
to the dad and to Lady Danbury, but they are all in the background and do not speak. I'm just putting it out here. And if you watched Bridgerton and you did not see this and you didn't see it, this is a message to you that colorism is happening all around you and you may not be seeing it. I'm just highlighting to you how ubiquitous it is. It is everywhere, right? Even in the new Gossip Girl, anyone watching the new Gossip Girl, Gossip Girl reboot, I was very excited when Gossip Girl was being relaunched. I have very fond memories of Gossip Girl when they mentioned how diverse the cast was going to be. I was really excited for the inclusion of people of color, for the inclusion of members of the LGBTQ plus community. Excited, but at the end of the day again, the black characters all have a certain skin tone. Now in the chat, I'm saying, was this on purpose? Was this intentional or unconscious? Even if it was unconscious, this is the point I'm making. We are calling it and that's why it's unconscious. Think about how many people would have worked on the show, worked in casting, just Think of the sheer numbers on a Shonda Rhimes production. People are missing it if it's unconscious. If it is conscious, it just means we have more work to do voicing the things in the room. Exactly, Hong An, similar discussion about the heights and the colorism in casting. It's about making these things that are unspoken, that are unconscious, more conscious so that they don't fall into the background. Okay, and you might be thinking, I don't care about the movies. I don't care about representation. I would like to make you care. And so the last thing that I would say is, imagine if the only time you see yourself on TV is cast as the villain. I just wanna drop that there. That's all. Representation is and remains super important. But let's take it to research. Let's take it to research. So there are several studies that I'm going to cite now. I've just called out the headlines, right? Um, this is Matthew Harrison. He's from the University of Georgia. This is his 2006 research. It found that when a light-skinned black male only has a bachelor's degree, a normal work experience, and is pitted against a dark-skinned Black male with an MBA, so a higher degree of qualification, and past management experience, the light-skinned person weighs out even though they are less qualified because he doesn't appear as menacing as the darker-skinned applicant. All right, I'm letting that soak in. Then lots of researchers in 2014, they did this study where they would put um, an impressive candidate in front of people and subliminally trigger them with words, right? Uh, about success, some with success. And when they showed the person back the photo after they, they showed the person a series of photos and where that person, that black person was intelligent and they asked them what skin color they were, they always chose a lighter skin color than the actual skin color of the person. So a more intelligent black person must be lighter skinned. So people are literally, literally rewriting people's skin color in as they reflect on their levels of intelligence. Nuts, nuts, okay? Again, 2015, Villanova University. All things being equal, all things being equal, white interviewers deemed light-skinned Black people to be more intelligent than darker-skinned Black people even when they had identical educational achievement, vocabularies, scores on tests, and a variety of other factors. So all the other stuff, same, but the only difference is skin tone 
And yeah, lighter skinned people being selected as being more intelligent. I'm going to the chat for a second. Uh, there's a note about thinking about this colorism in your everyday speech. Um, Rosalind saying that she grew up with light skin mixed race people being held up as an ideal, the best of both and getting that kind of commentary through, which is unhelpful. And then we have a segue on Love Island, which I can't comment because I don't watch it, but hashtag no judgment, because if you knew some of the things I watched in my downtime, you would despair for me. You would despair. So no judgment from me here. Um, again, 2017, proving the darker skinned Black people experience more microaggressions and poorer physical health than lighter skinned Black people. We should be concerned about this. This should it has to be a concern. 2013, if you are a dark skinned girl, you are three times more likely to be suspended from school than your light skinned Come on, this is not great, it's here. Now, this one, I made sure and I put the notes in so I didn't forget. So this was a study of 12,000 black women imprisoned in North Carolina between 1995 and 2009. And this study found that black women with a lighter skin tone got more lenient prison sentences and served less time behind bars. So it literally, literally, can change and affect the courses of people's lives. And then finally, this is what Jude was alluding to earlier. This is a CNN study from 2010. And it says, the children of all races pointed to fair skinned cartoon characters when they were asked to identify characters that were pretty and smart and they attributed negative characteristics to cartoon characters with darker skin tones. Children. Children. And it makes me sad. It, it makes me sad. <sighs> and so, what now? Well, this is usually the point where everybody expects me to pull out a list of bullet points that tells you very neatly and tidily three or five things that I want you to go out in the world and do so that we can address this issue. Not this year. This year is a little bit different and different for many reasons. It firstly is different because there were so many things that I wanted to tell you how to do. I ran out of bullet points. And then I thought, well, I don't know who's coming to this and I don't know what they do in their lives, how this shows up for them. So how can I ask, how can I tell them what to do? What I really, when I decided to put on this event, I always start with what is the change that you want to bring about? What is it that you want people to do differently? And I think the first thing that I wanted is for people to understand what colorism is, that it's thing, and why it's important. And I hope that I have achieved that. But I want you to do something with that other than being outraged about it and shocked about it. And that thing you do is really dependent on you and where you are in your journey and what touch points you have and how you feel, right? And I don't want to prescribe that. I want you to do something. And I want the something to start with figuring out what that thing is, right? We have to move from being 
so handheld to starting to do some of the work ourselves. So is it that you need to know more about this? Do you want to read fiction about it? Do you want to read some of the studies? If yes, go off and do that. Do you work with children? Do you have kids of your own? Is your touch point diversifying what those children see, how they experience the world, how people of color are represented in your home, how different skin tones are represented in your home? Where you work, do you have any effect over the images that people see that represent your company? Are you working for a beauty brand? Hey, do you use beauty brands? Because maybe your thing is holding some of our beauty brands accountable for the colorism they perpetrate either through their lightning formulas or through not having enough skin shades that are representative of the entire black spectrum of color. You can do something about that by choosing how you use your shopping dollars, your buying dollars, your purchasing power. You can use your voice. How are you going to do it is my question. And I would love you to go away and spend some time and think about Yes, how? What is going to be that thing? How are you going to bring about this change? Maybe your thing is you're going to talk to people about this session. You're going to get them to watch the recording. You're going to start a conversation about it in your own landscape, in your own time. I don't know, but this year I am not giving you the answers. This year I am planting the seed. And I have to hope and trust that that seed sprouts and flourishes for every person and that no matter where it's planted, it grows some fruit. But the time from me doing the work and giving you a list of resources and telling you what next is over, that time is over. Now we're doing it together. We're taking the next steps together. We're bringing about change as we are. And I'm seeing some amazing things coming into the chat about talking to our children and rethinking traditional perspectives. Uh, Fee chiming in that she's been chatting with her 11 year old nephew about racism, uh, using Formula One and football to do that, right? Am I happy for the recording to, sh to be shared? Yes, obviously, everybody who signed up for this and is on here will get the recording. And you can all uh, feel free to share it, but don't let sharing be your only action. That's my action. You can share and put something else on the list, right? Embrace your power. Do something about it. Do something about it. I think the solutions are within our power and that we are all equipped to start the journey now. And I have about six minutes left. And in those six minutes, I think it might be wise to have a little quiz about some of the Trini slang that you learned. It's gonna be a short quiz, don't freak out. And you don't have to answer, remember, as much or as little as you want to. Good, the Trini word for hanging out or socializing. Which one is, ah, we got it, we got it in one, okay. <laughs> I like, <laughs> I like the little lemon. It's making me smile. Brilliant. That one is liming. Okay. The Trini term that is a slap, it's, it's a term of endearment. It's something you would call a loved one. Yes, a chunk of lungs. Everybody loves that one. Chunks or chunks is absolutely uh, a busy body or a nosy parker. <laughs> yes, it's a macko. A macko, you can call someone macocious, right? Okay. Uh, Doltish is the one that is silly or stupid that you're not supposed to call anyone. Okay. Wink. Um, and if you wanted to say, really? Is that so? Yeah, exactly. It's the uh huh. Uh-huh, with the side eye. I love Hong An for putting the side eye in. Uh-huh would be that one, right? And the last Trini slang, this is not a quiz, it's not one you know, is we done or I done, which means that's the end. I said all of the things that I wanted to say to you in this one hour session. 
and we're finished. I want to thank everyone so much for joining today. I hope that you learned something and I hope that you enjoyed today's session um, and that you share it, but most importantly, that you really think about what's next for you what you're going to do to tackle this issue and how you are going to put in the work so that together we can stamp out colorism.